Welcome to this presentation on reporting abuse and neglect for children in care. Keeping children safe is the responsibility of all Oregonians. It's a top priority at DHS. Working together, we can stop the abuse and neglect of Oregon's children and young adults. You play an important role in this work. Your work with children and young adults means you may see or hear of a child or a young adult who is not cared for properly or is being harmed. We rely on you to be the eyes and ears of our community. This module focuses on additional abuse types for children who live in or receive services from a child caring agency, ODDS licensed group home, ODDS certified foster home, or a child welfare certified foster home. If you suspect abuse or neglect of a child or a child in care, call your local child abuse hotline or you can call the SAFE line at 1-855-503-SAFE. That's 1-855-503-7233. The SAFE line is staffed Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. It directs calls reporting abuse for all vulnerable populations. As always, if someone is in immediate danger, please call 911. Everyone has a responsibility to protect those who cannot protect themselves. Oregon state law requires people who work in certain professions to make a report if they have reasonable cause to suspect abuse or neglect has happened. These people are called mandatory reporters. Mandatory reporters are a crucial link in the system to protect Oregon's most vulnerable citizens. Mandatory employers include Employees of DHS, Oregon Youth Authority, Oregon Health Authority, employees of Community De Developmental Disabilities Programs, employees of County Justice Departments, employees of Community Mental Health Program, school employees, psychologists, certified foster care providers, and employees of child caring agencies, and licensed medical professionals such as doctors, nurses, physicians assistants, and nurse practitioners. Mandatory reporters are required to report any suspected abuse of Oregon's vulnerable populations 24 hours a day, seven days a week, wherever they are in Oregon, whether or not they're at work. These vulnerable populations include children, adults over the age of 65, adults with physical disabilities, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and adults who experience mental illness. As a mandatory reporter, you need to be able to spot when there is a suspicion a child has been harmed or their needs are not being met and make a report. You do not need to know whether or not your concern meets the leg legal definition of abuse. That will be done by a trained Child Protective Services provider. In general, abuse includes physical abuse, which is an injury to a child that is not accidental. Mental injury, the result of cruel or unconscionable acts or statements that are threatened, made, or permitted to be made by the caregivers, which have a direct effect on the child or the caregiver's failure to provide nurturance, protection, or appropriate guidance. It also includes the caregiver's behavior, intentional or unintentional, which must be related to observable and substantial impairment of a child's psychological, cognitive, emotional, or social well-being and functioning. Sexual abuse, the use or attempt to use a child for sexual gratification, including incest, rape, sodomy, sexual penetration, fondling, voyeurism, and so on. Neglect, failing to provide adequate food, clothing, shelter, supervision, or medical care. Threatened harm, subjecting a child to a substantial risk of harm to his or her health or welfare. To learn more about mandatory reporting in Oregon, click on the link below. It is essential that you understand that you are a mandatory reporter. Given the work that you do as a foster parent or an employee of a child caring agency, you also need to understand there are expanded abuse rules that apply to children in care. First, let's explore some definitions. 
child. Oregon law defines a child as an unmarried person under the age of 18. A child in care is defined as a person married or unmarried under the age of 21 who lives in or receives services from a child caring agency, a certified foster home, or a certified group home for children with developmental disabilities. A child caring agency is licensed by the Oregon Department of Human Services. These agencies provide psychiatric day treatment, adoption placement services, residential treatment, private proctor foster care, academic and therapeutic boarding schools, outdoor youth programs, and homeless youth and runaway shelters. Are the abuse types different for a child in care? They are. More accurately, some abuse types are expanded for children in care. These expanded abuse types apply to children who reside in or receive services from a child caring agency, ODDS certified residential group home, ODDS certified foster home, and child welfare certified foster homes. These expanded definitions aim to provide protection for the unique vulnerabilities of children living in or receiving services. The expanded abuse definitions for a child in care include neglect, abandonment, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, financial exploitation, involuntary seclusion, and wrongful restraint. Let's look at each one. Neglect of a child in care is the failure of a child caring agency, foster home, caregiver, or other person to make a reasonable effort to protect a child in care from abuse. Neglect also means failing to provide the supervision or services necessary to maintain the physical and mental health of a child in care. For example, a child in a residential facility engages in self-harm while alone in their bedroom. The nurse notified of the child's injury is concerned the child should have had constant supervision. The nurse is concerned there may have been a lapse in the necessary supervision. Here's another example of a neglect of care. A foster home mother realizes that the child placed in her home is out of their seizure medication. She forgot to fill it in time. The foster mother waits five more days to call the pharmacy to get the prescription refilled and does not notify anyone about this lapse in medication administration. Make a report if you suspect the basic needs of a child in care are not being met by their provider. Abandonment of a child in care is the desertion or willful forsaking of a child in care or the withdrawal or neglect of duties and obligations owed to a child in care by a child caring agency, caregiver, or other person. For example, a group home of young adults from a residential facility for children with developmental disabilities go on an outing to a farm. A school staff person becomes irritated with one of the adult's behaviors. She chooses to stop at a public rest stop, ask the young adult to get out of the vehicle, and leaves him with no plan to return. Make a report if you suspect a child in care has experienced abandonment. Physical abuse is the willful infliction of physical pain or injury upon the child in care. For example, a staff person from a group home for youth with developmental disabilities takes a child to the store. The child has a meltdown in the parking lot. The staff person pulls the child by their ear to get them into the car. The child is not injured, but says it hurt. Another example is a five-year-old girl who was placed in relative foster care with her aunt as a foster parent. Her aunt, the foster parent, regularly spanks her with a wooden spoon. It leaves no marks, but the child mentions it to you. Make a report if you suspect a child in care has been physically abused. Verbal abuse of a child in care means making threats of significant physical or emotional harm through the use of derogatory or inappropriate names, insults, verbal assaults, profanity, ridicule, harassment, coercion, threats, humiliation, mental cruelty, inappropriate sexual comments, or intimidation. 
Intimidation means compelling or deterring conduct by threat. Intimidation does not include age-appropriate discipline that may involve threat or action to withhold privileges. For example, a child becomes verbally and physically aggressive and the foster dad threatens to beat him and slams his fist on the table as he walks towards the child. Verbal abuse can also mean using language known to be a trigger for the child. For example, a staff person at a boarding school repeatedly humiliates and belittles a child by saying, you will never be anything but a little just like your parents. Make a report if you suspect a child in care has experienced verbal abuse or intimidation. Sexual abuse includes anything that is considered a crime. Sexual abuse of a child in care also includes any sexual contact between the foster parent, developmental disability provider, or child caring agency, even if the child is over the age of 18 and is legally able to consent. For example, a 19-year-old residing in an independent living program is seen flirting with a 22-year-old staff member. They are later seen in the community kissing at a bus stop. Here's another example. A young adult with developmental disabilities lives in a certified group home. He tells you something happened with a staff person in the bathroom that was uncomfortable. When you ask what happened, he said he doesn't want to tell you the details. Make a report if you suspect the child in care may be sexually abused. Financial abuse has a number of components. It's wrongfully taking the assets, funds, or property belonging to or intended for the use of a child in care. It's also wrongfully taking or appropriating money or property of the child in care. Misappropriating, misusing, or transferring without authorization any money for any account held jointly or singly by the child in care. Or failing to use the income or assets of a child in care effectively for the support and maintenance of the child in care. For example, a foster parent who is fostering a child with a developmental disability uses the child's social security income funds to purchase clothing and shoes for her own use. Here's another example. A caseworker visits a boy living in a child caring agency. The boy tells you he's mad because the staff took his money from his clothing voucher to purchase new bath towels for the bathroom. Staff told him the manager said they didn't have the money to, to buy new towels without it. Make a report if you suspect a child in care has experienced financial exploitation. Involuntary seclusion involves secluding the child in care for the convenience of a child caring agency or caregiver or to discipline the child in care. Seclusion means that a child in care is involuntarily confined to an area or room and is physically prevented from leaving that area. For example, a foster mother does not know how to cope with a child's behaviors early in the morning. She installs a lock on the child's bedroom to keep the child inside the room all night until the foster mother wants to wake up. Another example of involuntary seclusion is a staff member at a group home for a youth with developmental disabilities who becomes frustrated with the child's aggressive behavior. The staff member puts the child outside and locks the door to keep them from coming back in. That staff member then takes a smoke break. Make a report if you suspect a child in care has experienced involuntary seclusion. Wrongful restraint is the use of physical or chemical restraint of a child in care. Wrongful restraint does not include restraint prescribed by a physician or treatment or is consistent with an approved treatment plan or in connection with a court order. For example, a child in care living in a group home for children with developmental disabilities is placed in a headlock to prevent him from attacking another staff person. The child did not report any pain or injury after the incident. Another example is a child in care of a residential treatment program who tells you they were restrained for calling a staff a derogatory name last night, but was not being a danger to themselves or others. 
After review of a video, management determined the staff person did not have justification to initiate a restraint. Make a report if you suspect a child in care has experienced wrongful restraint. Your job is to share accurate information. You probably will not know everything about a situation or a child. Share what you do know. You're not responsible for knowing whether or not the situation you saw meets the definition of abuse. That's the job of a trained Child Protective Services staff member. The law clearly states that you must report when you have reasonable cause to believe a child with whom you came in contact with has been abused. Then either DHS or law enforcement will investigate the concern to determine if abuse or neglect occurred. No matter what the result, you did the right thing by making the report. If you have questions about whether or not to report, please call the Child Abuse Hotline or the Safe Line to talk with a trained Child Protective Services staff. Remember, you are a mandatory reporter. You must report to DHS or a law enforcement agency when you suspect child abuse has occurred. Telling your supervisor does not fulfill your legal obligation. You should also follow your employer or program's policies related to telling your supervisor or other staff members when you have made a report and there are immediate safety concerns. However, reporting to your supervisor or program management does not replace your requirement to report to DHS or the law enforcement agency. Do not delay your report to have the opportunity to speak with your supervisor. Regardless of when or where reported or suspected abuse occurred, you must still report it. There is no statute of limitations on reporting child abuse. Report it when you learn about it or when you suspect potential abuse or neglect has occurred. Worried that you don't have enough information? Share what you do know. It's important to share as much information as you can, such as the name of the child, the age of the child, the location where you suspect abuse happened, where the child lives with their family, foster care, residential care, etc., the details of why you suspect there may be abuse, such as who is involved, what happened, where it happened, when it happened. Regardless of the amount of information you do or do not have, make the report. You do have the right to be anonymous. To do this, tell the screener your wish. Do not provide your name at any time during the call. However, remember this. Every reporter's name is kept confidential except if requested in specific legal actions. It can be helpful to the investigator to be able to contact you if they have additional questions, but it's up to you. Regardless, your name and contact information will not be shared in the process of the investigation or in the report. If you do provide your contact information, we will notify you of the screening decision and if it's opened, the outcome of the investigation. If you choose to remain anonymous, ask for a case number at the end of the call and note the date and time of your call. This helps document that you met your requirement as a mandatory reporter. You can get more information about mandatory abuse reporting at the following website http colon backslash backslash go dot usa dot gov slash x N capital R F eight. Here are some resources related to the child abuse hotline directory and again the link for mandatory reporting information. The work that you do is important, including your responsibility to report suspected abuse or neglect. If you know or suspect someone might be in danger, we need you to call one eight five five 503 SAFE or 1 855 7233 or call your local child abuse hotline. If you are concerned that someone may be in immediate danger, please call 911.